If you haven't already seen my video on the classification of anemia, I'd go watch that first because classification is half the battle in learning anemia. So, anemia we know is a condition that's characterized by low hemoglobin or red blood cell values, less than 12 grams per deciliter in females and less than 13.5 grams per deciliter in males. The different types of anemia can be split up based on the mean corpuscular volume, or MCV, into microcytic anemia, when it's below 80 femtoliters, normocytic anemia, when it's between 80 and 100 femtoliters, and macrocytic anemia, when it's above 100 femtoliters. In this video, we're going to focus on the microcytic anemias. These include iron deficiency anemia, sideroblastic anemia, anemia of chronic disease or inflammation, and thalassemia. Let's start with iron deficiency anemia, the most common anemia. Around 9-12% of white women have iron deficiency anemia, while in black and Hispanic women, the prevalence is nearly 20%. It's also estimated that around 10% of patients over 65 with iron deficiency anemia have an underlying gastrointestinal cancer, so in these patients it's crucial to rule it out. Now some physiology. Iron is a crucial part of the haemoglobin molecule. Therefore, if we are lacking iron, then it's logical that haemoglobin production is impaired. Specifically, it's part of the formation of heme, which is the portion that actually binds oxygen. Heme is formed in a series of steps starting from glycine and succinyl coenzyme A, which is acted on by aminolebulinic acid synthase and forms aminolebulinic acid. Aminolebulinic acid dehydratase then converts this into porphobilinogen. Porphobilinogen then is converted into uroporphyrinogen 3, that then gets turned into copropolphyrinogen 3. That's turned finally into protoporphyrin 9. Phew, we got there in the end. It's this molecule that gets combined with iron by ferrochelatase, also known as heme synthase. So, if you don't have enough iron, you can't produce enough heme, so you can't produce enough hemoglobin. Causes for iron deficiency are either that iron is being lost, such as in the case in chronic bleeding, like in colorectal cancers, peptic ulcers, or even with menstruation but you can also end up iron deficient from an inadequate intake of iron, which should normally be around 15 mg a day, depending on the age and the sex. So an adult male needs around 8 mg a day, an adult female needs around 18 mg a day, and this amount can even go up to 27 mg during pregnancy. Poor absorption of iron is also a cause of iron deficiency anemia. And bear in mind that iron needs acid to be absorbed properly, so people using proton pump inhibitors or patients with a gastrectomy are at risk. Additionally, iron is primarily absorbed in the duodenum, so you can also have problems absorbing iron in things like celiac disease. Clinical features for iron deficiency anemia include the usual anemia symptoms such as pallor, especially in places like the conjunctiva, fatigue and weakness, dyspnea, headaches and dizziness but can have more specific findings such as pica, where patients have a craving to chew on certain items, like ice. Diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia is based on labs and peripheral blood smear. Similarly to other types of anemia, we would ask for a complete blood count to see haemoglobin levels and the mean corpuscular volumes that we would expect to be below 80 femtoliters. You may also see low reticulocytes, which are a good indicator of bone marrow activity. Usually in adults, the value is between 0.5 and 2%. Although in anemic adults, you'd expect the percentage to be higher if the bone marrow was working correctly. Additionally, you'd look at the iron status of the patient. Serum iron levels would be low, normal range being 60 to 160 micrograms per deciliter. Ferritin levels indicate the amount of stored iron in the body, and levels would typically be low. A normal range is between 12 and 300 nanograms per milliliter in males and 12 to 150 nanograms per milliliter in females. Transferrin saturation would also be low, generally considered underneath 20%. Total iron binding capacity would be higher, meaning that there's more space for iron to be bound. Peripheral blood smear would show small hyperchromic red blood cells. 
Treatment would be to investigate and treat the underlying cause and to provide iron supplementation. Iron tablets are commonly prescribed roughly at 300 mg per day. However, due to the GI side effects such as constipation or diarrhea, dark stools and often stomach pain, the patient compliance is low. So, intramuscular injections or intravenous infusions may sometimes be used. Next is sideroblastic anemia. This is a form of anemia that happens because of some kind of abnormality in the heme synthesis pathway that I mentioned earlier. In this case, the body has iron, but something else has gone wrong. For example, if we look again at the heme synthesis pathway, we see that there are several enzymes involved along the chain, including aminolevulinic acid synthase and dehydratase. If we have problems with these enzymes, then we have problems in forming the end product, heme. This is exactly what happens in lead poisoning. Lead inhibits aminolevulinic dehydratase and furoquilatase. Drugs like chloramphenicol, linezolid, and isoniazid also affect ALA synthase, with isoniazid inhibiting vitamin B6, which is a necessary cofactor in the formation of aminolevulinic acid. The cause may also be genetic, such as X-linked sideroblastic anemia. It's important to remember though that sideroblastic anemia is highly linked to myelodysplastic syndromes. So what does this mean overall? Well, it means that ultimately iron can't bind to protoporphyrin 9 to form heme, either because protoporphyrin isn't being produced properly or because furoquilatase isn't working. This means that you have an accumulation of iron in the mitochondria since it isn't being used to form heme. These mitochondria that are full of iron end up surrounding the nucleus of the erythroblast and this is then called a ringed sideroblast. It stains blue with Prussian blue stain. To diagnose it, you may have a history including contact with lead or perhaps a TB patient being treated with isoniazid. In the labs, you'll see a moderate to severe decrease in haemoglobin and the MCV will be microcytic, usually. Serum iron is going to be increased, as is the transferrin saturation and also ferritin, with the total iron binding capacity being decreased. Peripheral blood smear shows erythrocytes with basophilic stifling, meaning that there are cytoplasmic granules of RNA precipitates, and Pappenheimer bodies, which are cytoplasmic granules of iron. Bone marrow aspirate would show the ringed sideroblasts I mentioned. Treatment involves providing vitamin B6 if the patient is undergoing treatment with isoniazid, and transfusions may be given when the anemia is severe. For genetic causes, a bone marrow transplant may be needed. Now let's do anemia of chronic disease or inflammation. In this situation, the patient is usually suffering from some form of chronic infection, like TB or hepatitis, chronic immune activation, like inflammatory bowel disease and lupus, or also a malignancy. What happens in these conditions is that there is a release of inflammatory cytokines, specifically interleukin-6. Interleukin-6 mediates several effects, the most relevant one being the induction of hepcidin production. Hepcidin is a protein that regulates iron metabolism. Specifically, it inhibits ferroportin. Ferroportin is the iron export channel that allows iron to enter via enterocytes in the GI tract and also allows iron to move from the macrophages into the blood. Therefore, if we have an increased level of hepcidin, then less iron will be absorbed from the GI tract and less iron will be released from the macrophages, meaning less iron is available for production of heme, and so we get anemia. The reason this occurs is that it is a defense mechanism in the body, because it's an attempt to reduce the iron available, available for metabolism in microbes and therefore it's more difficult for microbes to grow. So how can we distinguish between iron deficiency anemia and anemia of chronic disease? In both cases, transferrin saturation is low, typically below 20%. So to distinguish it, ferritin levels will be elevated in the anemia of chronic disease and inflammation, and total iron binding capacity is normal to low. This is compared to low ferritin in iron deficiency and a high total iron binding capacity. Treatment involves removing the underlying causes in most cases. Finally, thalassemia, a form of haemoglobinopathy, meaning a disease in haemoglobin production. 
We've mentioned problems in heme production, but here the globin production is defective, and globin basically wraps around the heme molecule and protects it. Hemoglobin in adults is made up of two alpha globins and two beta globins, where fetal hemoglobin has two alpha and two gamma globins. In alpha thalassemia, the problems lie in the alpha globins, while obviously in beta thalassemia we have problems in the beta globin. We have four alpha genes and two beta genes. If one of the four alpha genes are affected, normally the patient is asymptomatic, while two out of four will give a mild anemia, and three out of four gives a severe anemia. This severe anemia is often called hemoglobin H disease, as hemoglobin molecules with four beta globulins may be produced. This is known as hemoglobin H. If all four alpha genes are affected, you end up with hydrops fetalis, as fetal hemoglobin can't be produced and without it the fetus dies. In beta thalassemia, it's generally called minor if one of the two genes is affected and is mostly asymptomatic, major if both genes are affected and intermediate if they have something in between and some function in one of the genes. Clinical features include the usual anemia symptoms we've mentioned, but in thalassemia, patients may also have hypersplenism or spleen enlargement. They can also have gallstones, which may present as upper right quadrant pain, and skeletal changes, such as the chipmunk faces. Diagnosis involves lab investigations and ruling out iron deficiency anemia with ferritin and iron levels, then doing hemoglobin electrophoresis, followed by DNA analysis. In cases that need treatment, transfusions may be done as well as iron chelation to reduce the risk of iron overload due to the repeated transfusions and folic acid supplementation may be given.